Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad عنه, was a man accompanied with divine promises, divine guidance, and divine help. It was as a result of this that in every single one of his undertakings, he would achieve great success. It comes as no surprise that in every single one of his steps that he took and every single initiative which he began, he would achieve the highest possible standard and the greatest possible success. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to another episode of Ahmadiyat, Roots to Branches. I came merely to sow the seed. That seed has been sown by my hands. It will now grow and blossom forth and none dare impede its growth. Ahmadiyat, the true Islam, is a flourishing tree. But this is not just any tree. This is the tree, the seed of which was sown under the guidance of Allah Himself through the hands of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi. Its miraculous growth in the midst of difficult and seemingly impossible circumstances is indeed a tale that is bound to increase one's faith, as if this is the tree that grew from concrete. Presently, under the guidance and leadership of our beloved Khalifa, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed, may Allah strengthen his hands, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat is now present and propagating the peaceful message of Islam in over 200 countries around the world. The Jamaat has built over 15,000 mosques, over 30 hospitals, and over 500 schools. It has translated the Holy Quran into over 70 languages. This is but merely a glimpse at the progress and a fraction of the achievements of Ahmadiyyat in only one single century. But this is Ahmadiyyat at present. Let us now take a step back and witness exactly how Ahmadiyyat, by the sheer grace of Allah, reached this point and attained these heights. For history is not only a means to understand and appreciate the present, but also a means to envision the future. Follow us on this journey. On today's episode of Rooster Branches, we will be taking a look at some of the amazing feats accomplished by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community under the leadership of Hazrat Khalifa al Musi II, Razi Ta'ala Anhu, which transpired between the years of 1924 and 1930. We will take a look at the development and the expansion of an institution which was established by the Promised Messiah والسلام, himself. We will then take a look at the crucial roundtable conferences and the services of a great servant of the second Khalifa and of Islam and Ahmadiyyat. We will then take a look at an amazing and interesting feat of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as well as the Pledge of Allegiance from one of the sons of the Promised Messiah but first, let us begin by taking a look at a series of jalsas which began on the topic of Sirat al Nabi. Near the end of 1927, Hindus of the Indian subcontinent began to vehemently attack our beloved master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And they reached the point where they would fill books with lies and with slander and with filth, and they would spread these books all throughout the land. Now, in response to this, Hazrat Muslim Maud stated that the best way to retaliate and to respond to such attacks was not to respond to allegations one by one, but rather it was to hold conferences, it was to hold gatherings, it was to hold meetings regarding the beautiful character of the Holy Prophet and to urge and to convince people to study his life themselves. And they would naturally reach the conclusion that these lies and allegations were, were false and they were baseless. And so for this purpose, Hazur called upon 1,000 speakers to come forth and to present themselves who would study the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and then go around, India, go around the Indian subcontinent and hold these gatherings. Hazur also stated that to be a Muslim was not a condition. And if any Hindu or if any Sikh or if any Christian person wished to study the life of the Holy Prophet and to present his beautiful teachings in a positive light, 
then they were free to do so. Now, this campaign, the result of this campaign was that all throughout India, gatherings were held in which the beautiful character and the pristine teachings of the Holy Prophet Wasallam were told to the world. And even non-Muslims came forth and presented their houses and their properties in order to hold these gatherings. And so this campaign was so successful that it was held in even other parts of the world other than the Indian subcontinent, such as places like Australia, Mauritius, Iran, Iraq, and even London. And so with this successful campaign, a very grand prophecy of Hazrat Muhyiddin ibn Arabi rahimahullah was fulfilled. And in this prophecy, he stated that this high rank granted to the Holy Prophet Muhammad wasallam, which is known as Maqam Mahmud according to the Holy Quran, it would become manifest through the Imam Mahdi. And so this was fulfilled through one of the Khalifas of the Imam Mahdi, whose name was also Mahmud, referring to Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. From the very outset of his Khilafat, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih II, Razila Talano, felt that in order to broaden the scope of Tabligh to an international level, the Madrasa Ahmadiyya, which had been established by the Promised Messiah, should be expanded to the level of an Arabic college. Now, in order to fulfill this task, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih II, Razila Talano, initiated a committee which would look into the various matters of completing this task. Now, some members of this community were Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmad Sahib, M.A., Razila Talano. Hazrat Mulana Sarvar Shah Sahib Razilatala Anho and Hazrat Mir Muhammad Ishaq Sahib Razilatala Anho. Now, this committee came together and they devised a scheme. And this scheme was reported in the report of Sadr Anjuman of the year, in the year of 1919 and 1920. And in this report, the committee said that we came together and we, we devised a scheme in which scholars would be produced not only to be spread throughout India, but to be spread throughout the entire world. And the only institution which has um, uh, Muslim Maud has deemed fit to be expanded to complete this task is Madrasa Ahmadiyya. So we have devised this scheme and after the approval of Hazrat Muslim Maud we are going to uh, put this scheme into place. And it was. And it was established, this new scheme, in the first three years of Madrasa Ahmadiyya. And the reason uh, it was only in the first three years was that so all those people who were already attaining an education in Madrasa Ahmadiyya would not be disturbed by the new scheme as it was very different. And alongside this, another program was running known as Molvi Fazil, which ran uh, according to the same pattern of a university program. Now, later on in the year of 1924, Hazrat Muslim Maud advised the Sadr Anjuman that you should establish this institution as a college on its own. Hence, Sadr Anjuman began working on this. And on April 15th, 1928, they established this institution and by the name of Jamia Ahmadiyya. Now, the Molvi Fazil program, which had been running, was split into two years and became the first two years of Jamia Ahmadiyya, known as Darja Ula and Darja Saniya. Then the missionary training program, which had also been running, was also split into two years and became the next two years of Jamia Ahmadiyya, known as Darja Salisa and Darja Rabia. Now, the first principal of Jamia Ahmadiyya was Hazrat Mulana Sarvar Shah Sahib, Razilatala Anhu. And amongst the first professors of this institution were Hazrat Hafiz Roshan Ali Sahib, Razilatala Anhu. Hazrat Mir Muhammad Ismail Sahib Razilatalano and Hazrat Mir Muhammad Ishaq Sahib Razilatalano. Now, after the initial process of this institution had been set into place and it was it had begun uh, begun to run smoothly, uh, Hazrat Muslim Maud Razilatalano inaugurated Jamia Ahmadiyya on May twentieth, nineteen twenty-eight. Now, when he came and he gave the inaugural address, he advised all those who were there that, you know, the Promised Messiah Islam established Madrasa Ahmadiyya in order to give the members of, a, of the community a chance to complete the Quranic injunction, which is that there should be a party from among you who invites to do good. And he said that it was seen that those who would graduate from Madrasa Ahmadiyya, some of them would go out and start doing other jobs and would you know, do other businesses. However, the purpose which the Promised Messiah had for those who would come to Madrasa Ahmadiyya was not that they would just come, attain an education and go out and do other jobs. Rather, it was for them to come and attain an education and become missionaries who would spread the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat. He said that, hence, for this reason, we have expanded that same institution to Jamia Ahmadiyya, and all those who will attain an education here will become missionaries who will spread the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat. Then, in terms of the belief, he said that this institution should not only teach religious matters, but should also teach languages. He said that when a missionary goes to a country, 
He should know the local language so that he may be able to communicate with the people and spread the message of Islam and Ahmadiyyat in an efficient manner. He then addressed the students and said that you are the pioneer students of this institution. You are the primary bricks laid for its foundation. He said that if the foundation is crooked, then the wall which is built upon that foundation will also be crooked. In this way, he elaborated for the students the responsibilities which were on their shoulders being the pioneer, pioneer students of Jamia Ahmadiyya. So it was in this way that Jamia Ahmadiyya was established. And it was according to the desires and the efforts of Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih II, Nazila Ta'ala Anhu, that this institution continued to expand, so much so that we see it even today established in so many different countries. Aside from India, it is established in Pakistan, it is established in Africa, in the UK, in Germany, and even here in Canada. Further proving the fact that this institution of Jamia Ahmadiyya is one which is divinely commissioned. Sir Chaudhary Muhammad Rafullah Khan Sahib radiallahu anhu, one of the most celebrated companions of the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, a prolific author, an austere academic, and a most celebrated personality in all walks of life, was so celebrated in both the worldly respect as well as spiritual. He served not only as the president of the International Court of Justice, and not only did he represent in the General Assembly of the United Nations, but he became the president of the General Assembly as well at The Hague. He is known for having done the work as a general secretary in 17 international majalis shura as well. However, this is just what the history books tell us about his later achievements. There are certain services that are not as spoken of, and especially our generation don't have an opportunity to get to hear about this very often. Perhaps most noteworthy amongst them is his services as a result of the Simon Commission. Now the Simon Commission was a 10 year project where the British government actually deployed agents to India to evaluate, identify, investigate, and better all aspects of the quality of life of the British citizenry in India. Not to mention the fact that the Simon Commission was to be reported and bills were to be passed after this. After this 10 year period, when the Simon Commission's report was brought back to London, three very famous conferences known as the Round Table Conferences took place. And the Viceroy representing in India at the time from London himself chose Chaudhary Muhammad Zafrullah Khan Sahib anhu as the representative for the entirety of the Muslim populace. What's amazing to note is that Zafrullah Khan Sahib anhu himself had no real interest in this, but he was chosen, hand-selected, and he became effectively a voice that would fight for the Muslim interest in these roundtable conferences from 1929 until 1931. And of course, Sujiya Sahib, as we know, his correspondence with Hazrat Muslim Anhu was absolutely pivotal and integral in the role that he played representing at these esteemed conferences. You know, Sabat Sahib, it's so interesting to note that Hazrat Chaudhary Zafullah Khan Sahib Anhu was once asked, what's the secret behind your success? And he said, there's only one secret, and the secret is my obedience to Khilafat. And so if we look at the life of Hazrat Chaudhary Sufullah Khan Sahib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and specifically when we look at his role in the roundtable conferences, we see that he's selected for the conference, and his first letter immediately to Hazrat Muslim radiallahu ta'ala anhu is that, oh Hazrat Muslim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, please pray that if I'm the right man for the job, and that if I can serve the nation of Islam in the best way, that I am the one that's chosen. Now we see from the very start that Hazrat Khalifa Musi Rabi Rahmatullah, he's described the relationship between Chaudhary Zafullah Khan Sahib radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Muslim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he said that Hazrat Chaudhary Sahib became like the tongue of Hazrat Muslim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we see this that he's in the conference, 
he attends the conferences day by day and everything that happens one by one he writes it in detail to Hazrat Muslim anhu, and he says that I am trying to effectively use every single point that you've mentioned in your book. Now we see that with these points Hazrat Chauli Zafullah Khan Sahib anhu, gained so much success, so much traction that among so many famous personalities that attended the conference including Aga Khan III, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and so many incredible British uh, journalists, generals, and personalities, including uh, scholars, we see that Hazrat Shahudi Zafullah Khan Sahib was the one who was brought into the spotlight. And we see that it's because of two reasons. First, as we have discussed, it was his obedience to Khilafat. And the second was the prayers of Hazrat Masih Ma'ud alayhi salatu wasalam and Hazrat Muslim Ma'ud alayhi you know, we see his life as a young, young child, he couldn't speak for a very long time. His mother was very worried. She wrote letters. He took him, she took him to the Buzurgan. And what was the response that came back? That when this man starts to speak, the whole world will listen. And we see that in conferences, including this one, this roundtable conference, including the, the Wembley conference that happened, everything that went on was because of the prayers and the obedience that was given to Hazrat Masih Ma'ud al-Islam and the Khulafa by Chaudhry Sufullah Khan Sahib. And we see that this conference became monumental for Jamaat. All these uh, objectives that were the wishes of the Khalif al-Masih of the time became, uh, you know, became fluent on the tongue of Chaudhry Sahib. And all these points, they became uh, effective in the conversation at the table talk points. And these were the points that were brought forward and approved finally in this conference. And so we see that Allah's plan and favor always goes with His servants and those who follow His servants. And we see that in this case as well. Jodhi Zafullah Khan Sahib represented the case for the Muslims in these roundtable conferences in the most brilliant and reasonable manner. And Muslims of the Indian subcontinent were confident and were satisfied that they had been represented very justly and very fairly. Jodhi Sahib's uh, services were not gone unnoticed, and in fact, he received much praise and recognition for his contribution to this Muslim cause. Khwaja Hassan Nizami Sahib wrote in 1934 that in these roundtable conferences, every Muslim, every Hindu, and every Englishman all together acknowledged this fact that in the Muslim population, it was Jodhi Zafullah Khan Sahib who had the greatest command over the complexities of politics. He went on to write that Jodhi Sahib is faultless and his character is irreproachable. One newspaper wrote that Jodhi Zafullah Khan Sahib represented all of the Muslim population so fairly and so justly that not even the most bitter and staunch opponent of the Ahmadi Muslim Jamaat could stand up and point a finger at him and say that he tried to represent Ahmadis, leaving aside the rest of the Muslim population, because such was not the case. He represented all Muslims equally. One newspaper echoed the voice of Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah Sahib, who was the founder of Pakistan, who once said regarding Jodhi Zafullah Khan Sahib, that Jodhi Zafullah Khan's mind is a magnificent and phenomenal gift granted to him by God Almighty himself. And so with all of this praise and recognition that he was, he was receiving, we can get a grasp of how wonderfully he represented the cause of Muslims in these roundtable conferences. And this was all merely due to the prayers and the guidance given to him by Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih, Hazrat Muslim Maud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The word encyclopedia literally means a complete and all-encompassing resource for one's education. The Encyclopedia Britannica was to become one of the greatest renderings and educational standards by which the world ascertains knowledge regarding all facets of life and death, of sciences, of biology, physics, chemistry, of the spiritual world, etc. As such, in 1930, just 41 years after the inception of Jamaat Ahmadiyya, when Ahmadiyya, and under this exact heading, an entry was made in the famous Encyclopedia Britannica, it became a standard resource for the entire world to learn about the community. Right. You know, uh, Sabat. Today we have phones in our pockets, we have laptops in our backpacks. And so we open up, you know, the internet and we have so many different resources. We have, you know, Wikipedia, we have different encyclopedias, 
We have YouTube for all these different videos on different subjects. But at that time, when there was no computer, when there were no resources, the Britannica Encyclopedia served as a status quo of research. And so we see that at this time, the entry made on Jamaat Ahmadiyya was monumental because it meant that the message of Islam Ahmadiyya was to spread throughout the world. And we see that all the educated folk of not only British UK, but everyone in the US, everyone who had their hands on the Brit Britannica Encyclopedia, now had their hands on the entry on Jamaat Ahmadiyya. And if we open up the entry, we see something that's incredible. We see that uh, the editors have talked about three main sects that are newly formed. One is the Wahhabi sect, the second is the Babi sect, and the third is Jamaat Ahmadiyya. Now, while the first two sects were very briefly mentioned, Jamaat Ahmadiyya had a very long entry in which all of the fundamental principles of Jamaat Ahmadiyya and the life of the Promised Messiah were, uh, were presented in this entry. So it said that not only was the Promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, the Promised Messiah and Reformer of the Age, but also it talked about things like the abrogation or the postponement of the Jihad of the Sort, or things like the Promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, coming as a source of peace, as a propagator of peace. And so we see that Allah Ta'ala's plans were such that people would challenge the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam and say that we're going to, you know, squash this Jamaat of Qadian like, you know, one does with a fly. But Allah Ta'ala's message and plan was such that the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam's message was being propagated not only by the Jamaat, but people who are not from the Jamaat. And in ways that a regular person or a person planted community could not even fathom. Certainly. And this is the blessings. And so we see that this was a monumental time in the life of the Jamaat and during the life of Hazrat Muslim Allah the promised son. Now, there's one other fulfillment of a prophecy to the promised Messiah which was very personal to him and also very important for the Jamaat that happened in the year 1930. Absolutely. You were referring, of course, to so many different prophecies that were made that I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth. And certainly this was a, a new color that Allah Ta'ala, God Almighty, gave to the fulfillment of this prophecy through the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yet, a particular and certain prophecy that was vouchsafed to the promised Messiah regarding the promised son, the Muslim Ma'ud, was a particular characteristic regarding which the Promised Messiah himself remarked that uh, of this or regarding this, the meaning is not quite clear. However, it was made clear as daylight when in the lifetime of Hazrat Muslim Maudadi Allahu Anhu, the words, he shall turn or he shall make three into four was seen in letter and spirit. See, so you say, the Promised Messiah in his time, three of his sons, had pledged allegiance to the Promised Messiah in his capacity as the Imam of the Age, as the Messiah, the Imam Mahdi. However, Sahib Zada Mirza Sultan Ahmed Sahib did not pledge allegiance to the Promised Messiah in his lifetime. Albeit, he had great respect and reverence and regard for the Promised Messiah to this extent that we have narrations from him to this effect that he says that. Uh, I have to present myself before Allah on the Day of Judgment. And I am compelled to admit that it has never happened, not even once, that the name Muhammad وسلم, was mentioned in front of my father, that his eyes did not fill with tears. And so all of the reverence and everything aside, God had to ensure the fulfillment of this prophecy that he shall turn three into four, uh, at the hands of Hazrat Muslim anhu, and so he did. And with that, we've come to the end of this episode of Ahmadiyyat, Roots to Branches. It's become a common theme that Hazrat Khalifatul Masih II anhu, would never settle for the mediocre. Whenever he would do something, he would do it in the best possible manner and would make what he was doing of the highest possible degree. When he expanded Madrasa Ahmadiyya into Jamia Ahmadiyya, he did so by saying that he desired for this institution 
to become one of the greatest colleges in the entire world. Then when it came to the round table conferences, when he was being represented by Chaudhry Muhammad Zirfullah Khan Sahib Razila Talanho, he kept Hazrat Khalifa Tum Masih II Razila Talanho's high standards in mind. And because of this, it was said that whenever Chaudhry Muhammad Zirfullah Khan Sahib Razila Talanho would speak, it was as if he was saying the words of Hazrat Khalifa Tum Masih II Razila Talanho. So in this way, the high standards which Hazrat Khalifa Tum Masih II Razila Talanho kept allowed those who would come after to also set their standards high. And it was a result of these high standards that has allowed the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to reach the point which it is at today. So with that, Jazakumullah for watching. Until next time, when by the grace of God, Ahmadiyyat will have branched out even further. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>